Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Congo Colonization and Conservation, a subseries of Guerrilla Radio Show. This is part four Gorillas in the Mist. As always, before each episode in this series, we'd like to remind all of our listeners that topics of a triggering nature, including violence, sexual assault, torture, and or other forms of abuse may be present in our conversation. Please feel free to skip ahead when we speak on these topics if you feel the need to do so. We would also like to remind y'all that we are absolutely open to critical commentary and fact-checking on the topics we discuss should we get something wrong. Please feel free to DM us on any platform we're on if you have information that would help make this show better. That's all for now. Let's get into the episode. The mountain gorilla, Gorilla Berenge Berenge, was discovered by German Captain Robert von Behringe, whose life remains largely unknown. A plaque written in English commemorates him at the entrance of the Virunga Conservation Area where the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda meet. But it is unknown who installed this plaque. Erroneously, the plaque calls him Oscar instead of Robert. Only a few copies of the reports of his expeditions in this volcanic region remain in museum archives and special libraries. Most of his personal records were destroyed in the bombing of Dresden. The following is an account of von Behringe from his granddaughter-in-law. Behringe wished to pursue a career as an army officer in the footsteps of his father. When given the option, he chose to join the Imperial Colonial Army for German East Africa. Behringe and his crew were stationed in modern-day Burundi and Rwanda and journeyed out from their posts toward the mountains, more accurately, a chain of volcanoes known today as the Volcanoes National Park, in order to, quote, maintain contact with local tribal chiefs, consolidate relationships with these chiefs, and to strengthen the power and their respect for the German administration. At the beginning of May 1903, von Behringe, who had been promoted to captain by then, led a squadron of eight European soldiers 115 African soldiers, or Askaris, two machine guns, and about 300 auxiliary warriors to campaign against the rebelling tribal chief Muezi Kisabo and, quote, force him into submission and recognition of German rule. At an altitude of 3,100 meters, the Germans put up their tent after they had tried to level the ground with moss they had gathered. The ridge was so narrow that the tent pegs had to be fastened into the slopes. The Askaris and the porters sheltered in rock caves and tried to protect themselves against the bitter cold with the help of fires. So, hold on. Did they not give the African soldiers tents? Is that what they're saying here? No, they did not. Damn! You know what? Who could have expected? Yeah, so Who'd it's thought? worth Who'd thought? mentioning here that these uh, brave European explorers, much like Jane Goodall and any other notable anthropologist or primatologist who has gone into the African wilderness to study these chimps alone, quote-unquote alone, has been uh, helped by a massive, massive force of, like, actual local Africans. Jane Goodall would have died in the wilderness if she didn't have, like, a bunch of Africans showing her out of her way around. Um, it's the same thing with Mount Everest. If you ever have known a guy who climbed Mount Everest, it's because the Sherpas guide them the entire way. You would die without a Sherpa. It's, it's just simply that these Africans don't get any credit for keeping these European explorers alive in conditions that they don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about how the erasure of Africans in these expeditions is part of the, the complex history, the complex legacy that Diane Fossey leaves behind and her treatment of local peoples. Yeah. So... As a direct account from von Behringe here, quote, From our camp, we saw a herd of large black apes who were trying to climb the highest point of the volcano. We succeeded in killing two large individuals. With a great rumbling noise of falling rocks, they fell into a crater opening towards the northeast. After five hours of strenuous work, we managed to get one animal up on a rope. Unfortunately, I was not able to identify the genus the ape belonged to. 
Now, if I remember correctly, these are the same gorillas Behringer brought back to New York. Is that correct? We'll get to that in a, in a mm -hmm. moment here. <laughs> so back to his granddaughter's account of his expedition. He thought that it could not be a chimpanzee because of the animal size, and until then, the gorillas were known to live in the lowlands and had not been found in the area of the East African Great Lakes, or the mountains, really. Uh, Robert von Behringer decided to send his discovery to the Zoological Museum in Berlin for examination. The ape's skin and one of his hands were eaten by a hyena on the way back to Usumbura. With the skull and the part of the skeleton that arrived in Berlin intact, Professor Paul Match, who worked at the museum, was able to classify the animal as a new form of gorilla, which he called Gorilla Beringer, after the man who discovered it. Fast forward quite a bit to the next Western scientist who would observe the mountain gorillas in earnest. George Schaller began his 20-month observation of the mountain gorillas in 1959, subsequently publishing two books, The Mountain Gorilla and The Year of the Gorilla. Little was known about the life of the mountain gorilla before his research, which described its social organization, life history, and ecology. George Schaller laid much of the groundwork for the primatologists that we will discuss next, namely Louis Leakey and the Trimates. However, he is more famous for being a conservationist with a decorated history of studying many animals. However, he got his PhD while studying gorillas in the Congolese mountains for 20 months in 1959. He's still alive today at 90 years old, but he has since gone on to spend the vast majority of his time helping with panda conservation, a very controversial topic in conservation today. So, as a little aside about pandas, Schaller wrote the book The Last Panda in 1993 about the politics and reality of panda conservation. Pandas have almost no interest in reproducing in captivity, which makes it a massively expensive and delicate balancing act to keep the charismatic mammals alive. Uh, for example, in 1993, when Schaller first wrote the book, it was estimated there were 1,500 pandas alive in the wild. Now, it's estimated to be 1,800. China generally views pandas as a national icon and is unwilling to let them die, much in the same way that Americans have prioritized the bald eagle as the symbol of American freedom. Unlike Americans, though, uh, China is actually willing to spend money on the pandas. Uh, it was actually a pretty common complaint when bald eagles were still endangered and undergoing conservation efforts that voters in Montana, for example, did not want their taxes going towards bald eagle conservation. I don't know, we just don't care here. Um, China, on the other hand, has set up about 67 dedicated panda reserves and spends about $255 million each year on their conservation. Uh, it's worth noting that this is a lot of money, like more than any other conservation efforts, really. And if $255 million doesn't seem like a lot of money for an industry as big and important as animal conservation, uh, yeah, you're right, it's really not. We don't spend a lot of money on animal conservation. But the reason why China spends so much money on panda conservation is because pandas are also very profitable. Um, at these 67 dedicated panda reserves, they also made $2.3 billion in profit from tourism and donations. That's profit, meaning subtract the costs, and they're still walking away with $2.3 billion. Now, despite the pandas' numbers not increasing in the wild much at all, they do have 600 pandas in captivity around the world, meaning technically they're not actually endangered anymore. We saved the pandas! Yeah, yeah you know, we, we saved the pandas, I guess, but... We did it. It's become a recent argument that pandas should be left to die off, since they aren't even that ecologically valuable. Uh, they only eat bamboo, which already suffers from massive die-offs, but uh, in my opinion, that's this seems like a recent take, sort of, as the, you know, second red scare against China, if that makes sense, where, yeah. uh, obviously, destroying the national icon of China would be kind of a massive blow, propaganda-wise, um, so there's a, obviously a uh, concerted American investment in making sure these efforts fail. But also, with the main concern being that so much money is being sent to pandas, China is also making a massive profit from it. Some of the argument is that that profit should be getting recycled to other animal conservation around the world. But uh, the problem with that is the other endangered animals throughout the world do not have economies like China. They don't have control over their own resources in the same way that China does. China is able to take this money that they're earning from panda conservation and tourism and put it back into their economy, put it into welfare programs, things of that nature. Um, whereas countries like the Congo cannot do that with gorillas. They don't have the means 
to really like structure their economy and make a profit off of tourism in that in that way. You know, I think maybe the bald eagle isn't the coolest animal for us to, us to be using to represent ourselves. You know, there's way there's way cooler animals in America. You know, we got grizzly buffalo. bears. We got grizzly bears, dude. I think it's sort of the fascist sort of uh, obsession with eagles in my mind. Yeah, but... that makes sense. We, we America likes birds too much. Birds aren't that cool. Every well, state's got a bird. We're losing all of our bird people audience, our bird watchers. <laughs> the bird audience is going away. But uh, yeah, with that being said, though, the panda is the World Wildlife Foundation's mascot, and it has been massively successful in popularizing conservation for that reason. That also comes with, you know, with pandas being the mascot of conservation, it sort of comes with the expectation that a lot of that money is going to be going to pandas rather than conservation as a whole. So I don't really think the solution to this is to let the pandas die off. That seems, again, like maybe an American propaganda type of assertion, but... It also seems like a massive marketing failure for conservationism as a whole. If yeah. we kill all the pandas on purpose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. it's, it seems like not a good idea. Like, I feel like even if the expectation is that most of that money is going to pandas, you can't spend any money if no more money is being spent spent on the mascot like my my proposed solution here is obviously that we have to start spending that money on other animals as well but also in order to do that we have to allow these countries that these endangered animals are in to have the control over their own means of production in the first place to be able to put that money back into their economy because if they can make money off of tourism and put it in you know towards social welfare programs they can do what China does, but other countries don't have the means to do what China does because they are under the foot of countries like America. Ideally, other countries, other exploited countries, could nationalize the profits from their own endangered charismatic animals, like orangutans especially. How, how would America and the Imperial Corps react to a nationalization of animal conservationism? You know, just six. Yeah, like so, they make so much money. Not well. Yeah, because, like, listen, it's real easy to go kill some dudes for oil and cocaine, right? Any Killing a guy time, because he cares about orangutans that much? That's a bad look. At any point in time, 50% of Americans will shoot themselves in the head to own the libs, okay? That's true. That's true. Yeah, the problem here is that right now animal conservation is entirely the realm of American nonprofits and NGOs. We have monopolized compassion where we want to feel like the good guys, so we have a complete stranglehold on charity. Yeah. And we can use that charity for whatever we want, especially as a means for capital expansion. So if they nationalize charity in that way, um, as China has, you can expect very similar think pieces, like maybe it's time to let the orangutans die off. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's exactly what this series is about. It's about how conservationism is a vehicle for imperialist control. It shouldn't be. It, sh yeah, it shouldn't be, but it, it's just another way that the Americans have spread their, their reach across the globe. Yeah. So uh, as a side note, before we move on to our next big guy, um, Schaller, you know, his whole thing was just first observing the gorillas as a Western scientist and publishing research on them. So like we have them categorized. We know that they're there. It's just up to someone to go out there and really observe them in the wild again. Schaller is also one of the very few prominent scientists who actually argue that Bigfoot reports are worthy of serious study. Greg, you'll like this one. W! Um, Big W. He describes, w, yeah. w, 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 W. He, he describes himself as a skeptic, but says that even if only 5% of sightings are not hoaxes, they should be scientifically examined to determine what exactly those people saw. So he's an interesting guy. Um, no, he's right. <laughs> I don't have a whole like, lot of... Austin wrote here, but won't say, say it out loud, because he's, yeah. he's afraid. He Frankly, I disagree, but it's funny that he him. believes that. <laughs> Wrong, Austin. <laughs> I don't, I don't real. Really agree, but I don't know. He, he seems like a, real. He seems like a mostly unproblematic force in this conversation, but that's also oh, yeah? because... A white guy got his PhD in 1959? You think he's never said anything problematic? Oh, no, he's for sure, but like in terms of guerrilla conservation, he just went there, got his PhD, and left. I, I don't know. It's not super well documented. He spent most of his time doing panda stuff, and writing books about the politics of panda conservation. He's 
not really the meat of this episode, so to speak. We should have called this episode Pandas in the Mist at this point. Damn. <laughs> Next, um, Louis Leakey. Louis Leakey is sort of the progenitor of modern primatology, in a sense. He was where it really took off. He's where we got Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Barute Galdikas. Mm -hmm. Also known as the Trimates, or, very terribly, Leakey's Angels. Very misogynist. I can see why they don't Awful. call them that anymore. <laughs> as a prominent and famous touring lecturer slash paleoanthropologist, one of the biggest parts of his legacies was sponsoring the Trimates. The story of his rise to relevance is also intricately linked to the story of the Congo. Lewis's parents, Harry and Mary Leakey, were Church of England missionaries in East Africa before World War I. His father, Harry, was working on a translation of the Bible into the Kenyan Bantu language, Kikuyu. Lewis was raised by a Kikuyu nurse named Mariamu and frequently played with the local children. According to Blake Edgar in the book, Lewis Leakey's Legacy, celebrating the centennial of his extraordinary life and finds. Apparently, he learned to speak the Kikuyu language, and even walked in their documented and distinctive gait, a manner of walking practiced by certain Kenyan tribes that allows women to carry massive heavy loads on their heads without much increased energy expenditure. This is interesting if it's true, as the researchers who reported on this walking style never managed to learn how to replicate it themselves as it is a skill taught from birth, passed down through generations. He was also, apparently, initiated into the Kikuyu ethnic group via a ritual in which he was sworn to secrecy about and given the name Waku Ruiji, or Son of the Sparrow Hawk. Interestingly, though, uh, his father, who was not initiated, was simply called Giteru, or Big Beard. It's a good name. It's a great name. If someone started calling me Big Beard, I'd be like, hell yeah, I'm Big Beard. Shout out. The reason for this aside, though, is simple. I'm not sure how much I believe all of that, and European colonists, as we have gone over throughout this entire series, like to exoticize their time spent on occupied land to lend an air of credulity to their time spent there, which, in truth, was time spent being cared for by Bantu servants and a private tutor while their parents, constantly complaining about how hard it was to be in Africa and coming down with bouts of, quote, frailty and exhaustion, tried to forcefully spread Christianity to Africa. Orientalism by Edward Said strikes again. It's never gonna not. It's never gonna <laughs> not. <laughs> it's always relevant. But yeah, like, this is a very common recurring theme. We talked about this with the guy who kidnapped Otabenga. He mm -hmm. talked all about how he was wrestling alligators in the rainforests, and really he wasn't doing any of that stuff. He was in a tent complaining that his tummy hurt while the Africans did all the work for him. It's the same thing every time. Europeans, yeah. colonial era Europeans were the kind of people to like gasp and faint whenever they saw like something particularly distressing. They were not built for this and they made people do all of their fantastic discoveries and exploring for them. Leaving Africa, Lewis was sent to Weymouth College, a private boys school, when he was 16 years old. However, he applied to college three years after because he was being bullied. Listen, this guy, this guy's out here in in Africa getting inducted into the ethnic group? He goes, what, you getting fucking bullied in a British boarding school, man? Come on. Come on! He received a scholarship to St. John's College in Cambridge and soon after matriculated to the University of Cambridge, his father's alma mater, in order to follow in his father's... Oh, baby. <laughs> Listen, obviously, right? Come on, look, who is this guy? Of course, this guy's going to go to his dad's college, and he's going to yeah. fucking, you know, he's a legacy admission. He, he probably didn't even have to write an essay. You know, yeah. it's like 1910, you know? college <laughs> A college exam is like four math questions, and like, can you write Four math name? questions, and, it, and to go to Cambridge, it costs $27. Yeah, God. <laughs> Man, I wish. So he received a scholarship to St. John's College of Cambridge, and began following in his father's footsteps to become a British missionary to East Africa. After World War I, as you may remember, the British had been awarded German East Africa as part of the settlement, which was then split with the Belgians. This also freed up Louis Leakey to return to East Africa and continue his father's ambitions. As an aside, can you imagine being a proud warrior of a tribal group in Africa that has existed for thousands of years and having a frail cholera-ridden Englishman try to tell you that his god is better than yours? 
Like, and he's in a three-piece... It's 120 degrees outside, and he's in a, a three-piece suit. <laughs> <laughs> within the... Uh, within the Tanganyika territory of the Germans, during their own occupation, they had discovered a site rich in dinosaur fossils, dubbed Pendigaru. Lewis was told by the British Museum of Natural History that it was going to send a fossil hunting expedition led by William E. Cutler to the site. Lewis applied and was hired to locate the site and manage the administrative details. Following this, Lewis switched his focus to anthropology and found a new mentor in Alfred Court Haddon, head of the Cambridge Anthropology Department. In 1926, Louis graduated with high honors in anthropology and archaeology. To accomplish this, he had used some of his pre-existing qualifications. Namely, he submitted Kikuyu as a second language, which he was required to be proficient in, even though no one could actually test him on it. The university instead accepted an affidavit from a Kikuyu chief signed with a thumbprint instead. Hmm. From okay. 1925 Hold on. on. Okay. On. This will become mm -hmm. relevant later. Oh, okay. Willa, do we okay, do we believe he actually speaks Kikuyu? I wanna say he does, just for now. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. because listen. Raised by a Kikuyu maid, learn how to walk with the gates. This all sounds to me. Like bullshit. Like the plot of Tarzan? Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Like, no way, right? Yeah. Um, no. His uh, his fake sort of, uh, you know, like, just trust me source on knowing the Kikuyu language will become relevant again later. So keep that in okay. mind, okay. everyone. Okay. All right. From 1925 on, Louis lectured and wrote on African archaeological and paleontological topics. Upon graduation, he was such a respected figure that Cambridge sent him to East Africa to study prehistoric African humans. He excavated dozens of sites, undertaking for the first time a systematic study of the artifacts. Leakey led a very active life and was highly involved in Kikuyu affairs for much of the rest of his life as a postgraduate research fellow, then professor and lecturer after that. He found himself embroiled in many legal battles and political tensions as resentment towards European colonizers grew. One particularly enlightening example of this time he spent on the political side of things is that Louis was summoned to be a court interpreter in the trial of Jomo Kenyatta, president of the Kenya African Union, but withdrew after he was accused of mistranslation because of prejudice against the defendant. Notably, he still stayed on the case to translate documents, and Jomo Kenyatta was sentenced to several years of hard labor by the British colonial government. Interesting. That... Interesting. 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 Or... Interesting. Yeah, so Leakey was a bit of an interesting guy in this regard because growing up among these people and you know, playing with their children, he had a bit of sympathy or maybe not sympathy, but understanding of them. Mm -hmm. uh, he... And I will say, I will say, I, like for mm -hmm. human beings, for the first seven years of your life, it does not take a lot of effort or energy to teach you a language. If yeah, he yeah. is indeed living among Kikuyu people, if he is being raised by a Kikuyu staff, that it's possible he probably had some proficiency at some point in his life. Did he maintain that, though, after going back to England, going yeah. to college, going to university? I would question that. Regardless of whether he knew the language or not, he used his status as one of the only people who knew the language in England at the time to just say that the defendant was saying whatever he wanted him to say. Wow. Um, which could obviously get him in quite a bit of trouble. Um, well, but... couldn't get him in that much trouble, but a certain amount of trouble. No, no, I mean... You're kind of guy, allowed to no, do whatever the, the you... Oh, oh, the defendant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, uh, certainly got the defendant into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Several years of hard labor, in fact, but... um. It's strange. Uh, he insisted on trying to reduce tensions between, you know, the colonizers and the local Africans on quite a few occasions. At one point, uh, stating to some Europeans that Kenya would never be a white man's country. Based. Take that for how you will, because he still sort of helped them colonize in the end, but... Not based. Yeah. <laughs> More relevantly to our episode and discussion, though, Leakey ran the excavation of Olduvai Gorge, an incredibly important archaeological site to the field of anthropology and science as a whole. If you don't know about this, uh, you should, because that's where we found, like, most evidence for human evolution in Africa. The fantastic discoveries coming out of Olduvai Gorge reached an eager and excited Western world. 
and resonated very strongly with one young Diane Fossey. Bum, bum, bum. Another quick note before we move on. Mm-hmm. It's a little interesting. Uh, Leakey was actually very insistent on the idea that humans had evolved out of Africa before he had real solid archaeological proof from Olduvai Gorge. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe this is maybe the mentality that some people are trying to have when they're trying to disprove this theory, but really this kind of science doesn't hold up anymore, and the fact that he was right was mostly coincidental, but... Yeah. Okay, can you, can you give us the cliff notes on Old Vi Gorge? What... So, it, it, it proves that humans evolved out of Africa. It gives us kind of a, 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 a lineage, almost, of human evolution. Yeah, so the Leakeys unearthed the, uh, I believe, Homo habilis, which is the first tool-using Homo species, I believe. Paranthropus boisei was also one of the important uh, early human fossils discovered here, and I believe they found fossilized bones and tools. Uh, yeah, no, they found stone tools. Oh, okay. So basically, this is where they like found out that early human... So early human ancestors began sprouting up and developing larger brains and using stone tools. A little bit of that in New York came out in you. Early human. It's also worth mentioning, semi-ironically, that Olduvai is a misspelling of Oldupai, a Maasai word for a wild sisal plant that grows in the area. Mm. We really we really drop the ball on a lot of things. It's I Not we, bitch. I ain't English. <laughs> Maybe you. Fair enough. So, uh, these massive archaeological findings were exciting to everyone, but especially, as we've mentioned, Diane Fossey. Reading now from Diane Fossey's biography on the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund website, along with a few other sources that we'll use, obviously. Um, Diane often dreamed of experiencing more of the world and its abundant wildlife. And after seeing photos and hearing stories from a friend who had just traveled to Africa, Diane decided that she must travel there herself. In 1963, Fossey began planning her first trip to Africa. She hired a driver by mail and prepared to set off to the land of her dreams. Uh, And that is directly from her website, a very rosy way of putting things. Yeah. We all know what happened. It feels odd that they would preamble this. Also, great little side note Austin put in here. Prior to her decision to go all in on what she viewed as a life of adventure, Fossey had worked with disabled children, something she later attributed her success in working with gorillas to. Which is, I think, in my opinion, a very normal and cool thing to say. No. (laughs) Crazy thing to say out loud. Yeah, come on. (laughs) So, here we have young Diane Fossey. She hears about... African exploration from the son of a British missionary, who himself is a bit of a colonizer, and decides, this sounds like a life of adventure. I want to put my entire life savings into this. So she did. It took Diane Fossey's entire life savings, in addition to a bank loan of, I think, around $8,000, to make her first trip to Africa a reality. This trip included visits to Kenya, Tanzania, the Congo, then Zaire, a bit of foreshadowing, and Zimbabwe. John Alexander, a British hunter, served as her guide. The final two sites on her tour were Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, the archaeological site of Louis and Mary Leakey, and also Mount McKenna in the Congo, where just four years earlier, George Schaller began carrying out his groundbreaking research into the mountain gorilla. $8,000 in 1961. Yeah, how, yeah, how much is that $8,000? Because I would love to $81,000. Take... Ooh, that's a lot of money. God damn! They just gave that out? <laughs> Apparently. They did if you were... White, yeah. Surprised they gave it to her. Yeah, it's a bit surprising that they gave it to a woman, yeah. but I don't know. Especially when her goal was go to Africa. Yeah. yeah. You know, imperial, imperialist adventures, you know, they, they come in all... They take all shapes and forms. Well funded you know? by banks throughout most of history. Well funded by banks. At Olduvai Gorge, Leakey gave Fossey permission to have a look around some newly excavated sites. She soon came to Leakey's attention by spraining her ankle, falling into the excavation, and vomiting on giraffe fossils. 
how how far why does she throw up I do. <laughs> why do you, why do you throw up i'm assuming from the pain. listen Leaky talked to Diane about Jane Goodall's work with chimpanzees in Tanzania, which at the time was only in its third year. He also shared with her his belief in the importance of long-term field studies with the great apes. And what he did not share with her was that he specifically only sent women on these expeditions because he believed in something inherently empathetic about women that allowed them to understand great apes better than men. And we've talked about this in our previous episode about the Trimates yeah. and Lewis Leakey. I've, um, beyond it just being a very creepy thing, it also has, for supposedly being like, you know, feminist science that primatology is, you know, the, the groundbreaking women, it has some very surprisingly misogynistic undertones to the actual reason why they were going out there in the first place. Yeah, like it's not even undertones. It's like foundational, it's foundational not, yeah, it's misogyny the to the, that. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of the entire reason. It's it the base upon uh -huh. which primatology is built. Yeah. This this Among is Lewis things. Leakey's hypothesis, basically. This is his core hypothesis that women will be able to do this better because they're more nurturing than men. Although Fossey had broken her ankle, she reportedly remained determined to encounter the mountain gorillas after this. Fossey was soon introduced to Kenyan wildlife photographers Joan and Alan Root. The couple agreed to follow Fossey and her tour guide to camp behind their own camp, and it was during these few days that Fossey first encountered wild mountain gorillas. Soon after, Fossey returned home to Louisville to reapply to her old job at the Children's Hospital in order to repay her loans. In this time, she published three articles in the Courier Journal newspaper detailing her visit to Africa. In 1966, Leakey gave a lecture in Louisville, and Fossey pounced on the opportunity to attend. Joining the crowd and waiting to speak in line with Leakey, when her turn came, she showed him some of the, of the article she had published. However, to her surprise, he remembered her and asked her to stay after the lecture. The next day, after an hour's interview at Leakey's hotel, he hired her to observe gorillas taking up where George Schaller had left off after completing his PhD in Mount McKenna. This is also how Barote Galdacost was hired. So apparently Leakey is just interviewing women in his hotel room. Or something. I No, <laughs> like the idea here is that Leakey was pretty famous at this point, right? Because of his findings in Old Divide Gorge. Got a lot of clout, you would say? Yeah. A man with a lot he of would, clout? He would gather crowds after his lectures and just like address and talk to everyone at once. And these like young mm -hmm. aspiring women would come up to him after his yep. lectures and just like ask him if they can do research. And he'll, and he talks to them personally and then just decides to give them the resources to go out on their own, which obviously there's been some inklings of accusations against him nothing really solid i don't think we talked about it in i think episode three but yeah it's still a very creepy sort of thing to be going on really in this guy's career Listen, yeah. like it he's isolating these women sending them out on their own respectable scholars are very 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 careful about the distance they keep with their students or subordinates or anything like that Right. The issue is there are not a lot of respectable scholars out there. Yeah. Um, but like you, you talk to any any you know researcher, professor, you know tenured, you know scholar of these caliber, and you're like, and they they have codes of conduct about this thing, because this kind of exploitation is very very common. It's it's a bad field. Like all of these academic fields pay like shit. They're super niche, they're super cloistered, and they 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 fester these kinds of exploitative, abusive they relationships. They really do. We, I, this is why I stopped getting a, ma a, ma a master's degree. I'm like, I'm not going to continue being in this environment. It sucks. You know, the, the academia, yeah. it's, it's terrible to be in. Speaking of which, uh, I'm hopping right back in, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, poor guy. <laughs> On January 6, 1967, Fossey arrived at the Virunga Mountains in a Land Rover and hiked into the mountains where she set up camp with Alan Root and a small party of local Congolese trackers. Once again, uh, probably would not have made it here without the Congolese trackers. 
On the way to the Congo, Fossey visited the Gombe Stream Research Center to meet Jane Goodall and observe her research methods with chimpanzees, which were, generally speaking, going a lot better than hers were about to be. However successful Fossey was at tracking and observing gorillas, and whatever strides she made in science and feminism and all that, uh, these things are unfortunately not very relevant to the overarching themes in the purpose of this Congo series. What's more relevant here are the circumstances leading to her arriving in the Congo and what happened as a result. As you may have guessed by the Congo being called Zaire at the time, Fossey had arrived in the middle of the Congo crisis. Lieutenant General Mobutu, by then Commander-in-Chief of the National Army, seized control of the Congo and declared himself president. When Diane Fossey returned to her base camp one day on July 9th, 1967, she found armed soldiers from Mobutu's military waiting for them to escort her and her party, quote, to safety. The week before, Joseph Mobutu had authorized Congolese radio to warn that foreigners were trying to take over the country and the borders were about to be closed. Diane spent two weeks in Rumangabo under military guard until, on July 26th, she was able to orchestrate a way out. According to Fossey's biography on her website, the story of her escape was as follows. She offered the guards cash if they would take her to Kisoro, Uganda, to register Lily, her Land Rover, properly and then bring her back. The guards could not resist and agreed to provide an escort. Once in Kisoro, Diane went straight to the Traveler's Rest Hotel, and the Ugandan military were called. The soldiers from the Congo were arrested, and Diane escaped. According to Anita McClellan, however, her editor at Houghton Mifflin, Fossey was in protective custody, quote-unquote, for 16 days and kept in a cage for the last two. She would later confide only to close acquaintances that she had been raped repeatedly. Now, uh, this is, of course, coming directly from her editor and not from Fossey, if what mm -hmm. she says is to be believed, which, admittedly, I don't have any reason to doubt this story necessarily, but it's also one of those things where famous people after their deaths, people adjacent to them will make up stories to sell, you know, the true story of Diane Fossey. And it could yeah. also be used to lend a bit of, you know, leniency. More sympathy to her story. It's a bit, whatever. yeah, to lend some sympathy to what she'll be doing next in Rwanda. So, now in Rwanda, she was unemployed, penniless and close to a nervous breakdown and fearful that Louis would think she had not tried hard enough. During this time, Diane met a woman named Rosamund Carr, who introduced her to a Belgian woman, Aliette de Monk. De Monk was born in the Kivu province and lived in the Congo from an early age, remaining there with her husband until the political situation forced them to move to Rwanda. Aliette de Monk knew enough about Rwanda to help Diane find an appropriate site for her new camp and renewed study of the mountain gorillas of the Virungas. With Aliette's help, she reached the alpine meadow of Kairasimbi, where she had a view of the entire Virunga chain of extinct volcanoes. With this, Fossey founded the Karasoke Research Center 9,800 feet up Mount Basoke, the defined study area covering 9.7 square miles. She became known by locals as Nir Makabeli or Nir Masabiri, roughly translated as the woman who lives alone on the mountain. It is here that she would build her legacy as Diane Fossey, the famous guerrilla researcher and anti-poaching advocate of gorillas in the mist. Many people do not quite know the extent of her anti-poaching activities, however. Sometime during the day on New Year's Eve 1977, Fossey's favorite gorilla, who she named Digit, was killed by poachers. As the sentry of the study group 4, he defended the group against six poachers and their dogs, who ran across the gorilla study group while checking antelope trap lines. Digit took five spear wounds in ferocious self-defense and managed to kill one of the poacher's dogs, allowing the other 13 members of his group to escape. Again, this is the sort of editorialized version of events from Diane Fossey's biography. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's very heroic last stand type stuff, you know? Yeah. And it's the same kind of anthropomorphizing, I suppose. Um, that kind of makes you want to give it a grain of salt. Yeah. So it's worth noting before we continue the story here that this biography is coming from the Diane Fossey Fund. Like, that's her website. That's the fund. Mm -hmm. um, Formerly this... known as the Digit Fund, right? 
Yeah. And so this becomes a bit obvious later. So, Mm -hmm. Digit was decapitated and his hands cut off for ashtrays. He was 12 years old. After his mutilated body was discovered by research assistant Ian Redman, Fossey's group captured one of the killers. He revealed the names of his five accomplices, three of whom were later imprisoned. Fossey later described Digit's killing as, quote, the saddest event in all of my years of sharing the daily lives of mountain gorillas. This event plunged Fossey into depression. She isolated herself in her cabin, consuming large amounts of alcohol and cigarettes. Fossey began devoting more of her attention to preventing poaching and less on scientific publishing and research. Fossey became hostile to any Africans who entered into the protected area, even shooting roaming cattle. Fossey subsequently created the Digit Fund, now the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, to raise money for her anti-poaching patrols. Through the Digit Fund, Fossey financed patrols to destroy poachers' traps in the Karasoke study area without the cooperation or approval of local Rwandan park officials, who Fossey did not trust. Park rangers were often paid a salary much less than Fossey's own African staff, and were thus much more susceptible to bribes from local poachers. It's also worth noting here that uh, I don't believe they were just destroying gorilla traps, I think they were just destroying any and all attempts at hunting in the area. Mm -hmm. And once again, every time we talk about poachers, we, we, we go back to you know, the people who are tasked with protecting or patrolling these areas. And we see that because of wage and labor exploitation, these people do not have the resources or or the means or the, the motivation even to actually carry out their job. It is monstrously easy just to walk in here with like 50 bucks in your pocket because these people are being paid pennies. It's, once again... The, the imperialist capitalist motivation for making this money is preventing any actual successful campaign against this or pr- to protect these animals. Yeah. If you're wondering what Fossey did if she caught poachers, uh, Fossey was reported to have captured and held Rwandans she suspected of poaching. She allegedly beat a poacher's testicles with stinging nettles, writing in a letter to a friend, we stripped him and spread eagled him and lashed the holy blue sweat out of him with nettle stalks and leaves. She even reportedly kidnapped and held for ransom the child of a suspected poacher. Fossey's National Geographic editor, Mary Smith, told of visits to the United States where Fossey would, quote, load up on firecrackers, cheap toys, and magic tricks as a part of her method to mystify the Africans in order to hold them at bay. She wore face masks and pretended to practice black magic to scare away poachers, which <laughs> pretty racist, this, right? This seems yeah. kind of racist. Like, listen, the torture already really bad. The, the 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 kidnapping, ransoming, and torture of local Africans to protect the wildlife, and like, listen, we what evidence is she like that she's not grabbing these poachers out of the wilderness, you know? She's, she is, she ransomed the child. Of, she sort of uh, the reason why it says suspected poachers is because she is just uh-huh. sort of like deciding of her own judgment of her own research in the area, which I think it's fair to say is a bit impaired at this point. Uh, and yeah. deciding to torture these people for what she has deemed a crime, something that we can't exactly prove, but we also have no jurisdiction over them. The rangers can't do anything to stop her. It's it's a bit of a rough situation all around. I, it, it blows my mind. She's like trying to do magic tricks at these people to scare them. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Okay. Writing in the Wall Street Journal in 2002, the journalist Tunku Varadarajan described Fossey at the end of her life as colorful, controversial, and a racist alcoholic who regarded her gorillas as better than the African people who lived around them. Could not have summarized it better myself than. Probably. Yeah. Like, once again, we, we have to know that she could not have achieved anything that she achieved without the help of these people, the local African communities. The anti-poaching patrols were Africans. She was paying Africans to essentially brutalize other Africans, which we've seen before. Yeah. 
if her methods were not any more clearly taken from the playbooks of imperialist police, of empire building, of colonial practices, we could maybe say, hey, you know, this is a, an interesting thing you're doing. You know, like, hey, you're, you're doing some good work protecting, but it's very obvious that what she's doing is it's colonialist fundamentally. It's the classic dropping into an area that you're really not familiar with, having someone introduce you to the area, and immediately taking charge and taking law and justice enforcement into your own hands. Yeah, it's vigilantism, which is obviously a huge aspect of this kind of, of project. According to Fossey's letters, ORTPN, the Rwanda National Park System, the World Wildlife Fund, African Wildlife Fund, Fauna Preservation Society, the Mountain Gorilla Project, and some of her former students tried to wrest control of the Karasoke Research Center from her for the purpose of tourism by portraying her as unstable. In her last two years, Fossey claimed not to have lost any gorillas to poachers. However, the Mountain Gorilla Project, which was supposed to patrol the Mount Sabiño area, tried to cover up gorilla deaths caused by poaching and the diseases transmitted through tourists. Nevertheless, these organizations received most of the public donations directed towards gorilla conservation. These tensions and constant battles with local poachers and Africans came to a head one day on December 26, 1985. Diane Fossey was found murdered in her cabin in Karasoke. Her body was found face up near the two beds where she slept, roughly seven feet away from a hole that her assailants had apparently cut in the wall of her cabin. Wayne Richard McGuire, Fossey's last research assistant at Karasoke, was summoned to the scene by Fossey's house servant and found her bludgeoned to death, reporting that when I reached down to check her vital signs, I saw her face had been split diagonally with one machete blow. After Fossey's death, her entire staff was arrested. This included Rwandan Emmanuel Relicana, a tracker who had been fired from his job after he allegedly tried to kill Fossey with a machete, according to the government's account during the trial. All were later released except Relicana, who was later found dead in prison, allegedly having hanged himself. Rwandan courts later tried and convicted Wayne McGuire, who had fled to America for her murder. The alleged motive was that McGuire murdered Fossey in order to steal the manuscript of the sequel to her 1983 book, Gorillas in the Mist. At the trial, investigators said McGuire was not happy with his own research and wanted to use any dishonest means possible to complete his work. McGuire would not return or be extradited to Rwanda as the penalty for this conviction was death by gunfire. The last entry in Diane Fossey's diary reads, when you realize the value of all life, you dwell less on what is past and concentrate more on the preservation of the future. Fossey is buried at Karasoke in a gorilla graveyard that she herself had constructed for the gorillas she observed who had been killed by poachers. She is buried amongst her gorilla friends. More specifically, she was laid to rest next to her beloved Digit. I think we can agree. Fossey's a bit of a controversial figure. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, when people think of Diane Fossey, they think of gorillas in the mist. They think of the lady that, you know, tried to save the gorillas. But they often don't think about Diane Fossey, the alcoholic racist who shot at Africans for going into her area of study that she declared without any particular authority. Ultimately, Fossey fell into a very easy trap of becoming very traumatized by the conditions that she left in search of adventure for. She she grew very close to these gorillas and studied them without any particular qualifications, more so just uh, Leakey's idea that women are good at studying gorillas because they're empathetic, and she ended up getting way too attached to the gorillas. She took all of their deaths personally, she named them all, gave them all funerary rites, and it drove her a little crazy, and she did terrible, horrible things to people who didn't have the same view on the gorillas as she did. Yeah, it's, like, I think you, you said it pretty clearly. She just declared this zone her private sanctuary, her private, her private property, right? And she was gonna defend it with violence. And it's, despite maybe 
the uh, noble intentions of studying and preserving the gorillas. Uh, private property and and this 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 decision to defend this violently what is fundamentally a rotten kind of decision to make you know it, it comes from a bad place and of course when with her experiences whatever validity there are to them mm. it's gonna turn out bad yeah. it's gonna turn out tragic i think this mirrors colonialism in and of itself in that mm -hmm. you know one of she's the many, like a little microcosm for it yeah. yeah one of the arguments for colonialism is that oh everywhere that was colonized had massive increases in means of production and you know living conditions what they're not realizing is when you go about things in that way the power imbalance skews things in such a way that only you are benefiting from these improvements and when not everybody is getting the same value out of these supposed improvements that you are it becomes very uneven and things like this arise naturally as a consequence of your actions they don't arise mm -hmm. because of something inherent to the culture or, you know, the the primitivism of the people in the area surrounding you. It happens because you are not fully recognizing their humanity. Or their autonomy, yeah. Yeah. Did Wayne McGuire kill Fosse? How do we feel about that? Um, anybody could have killed Fosse is the thing. She had countless enemies. She was... Yeah, she was, she was very out there hostile. torturing people. Yeah. Anybody could have killed her. They pinned it on anyone they could. They pinned it on one guy who killed himself. They pinned it on another guy who fled the country. So, really, this is a case where they just wanted to pin it on someone and be done with it. Yeah. So that, you know, they don't have to do a full investigation. Because it really could have been anyone. Because, frankly, nobody there liked her. Thank you, everyone, for listening to episode four of our Congo series, Girl in the Mist. Our next episode will be about the Congo crisis in depth, post Lumumba, and that will be the wrap on this little mini series we've done. Um, so please, you know, share this episode, share, you know, tell everyone, hey, you got a week or two to, about a week. We're going to release the next episode in a week because we're behind a little bit because Austin's been moving, Greg's got a new job. I'm moving. We're busy, busy people over here. Um, but one week... We're a little busy bees. Episode, we're busy little bees. One week, episode five is coming out. So, share the series with everyone you need to tell about. Tell them to catch up, to get ready for the finale. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter, as always, at gorilla underscore underscore radio. You can find us on Patreon and help us make this series... Help us, you know, push through. Uh, we have no money, folks. We're spending all our money. We started where we've all in between jobs. Life sucks. Um, but what's what's the series? Money. Once the series is all wrapped up, we're gonna ship it up. We're gonna package it together nicely. We're gonna send it to people who are interested in this sort of thing. I yep. think this is an important like marker for a proof of concept that we can do research that we can like establish something from this podcast that'll set the tone for what we can talk about for the future yeah but um, so keep an eye out for a, a new rss feed or a new you know thing where this is all going to be alone thanks for listening everyone back to your regularly scheduled goofy bits soon soon after after the mumbo we are gonna really just gonna spread our wings we're gonna get a little silly we're gonna get a little goofy we're gonna have a great time thanks everyone for watching see you next time <laughs> see you next time see you next time <laughs>